election, and it's absolutely vital that they get the chance to do so. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11602 in the name of Jim Eady on the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Scotland and European Antibiotic Awareness Day. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Mr. Reedy, if you are ready, I would call on you to open this debate, and you have seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to colleagues in all parties who have supported the motion in my name, and I welcome this opportunity to open today's debate on European Antibiotic Awareness Day, which took place in November last year, and to pay tribute to the valuable work undertaken by the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in raising awareness of the issue of antimicrobial resistance. This is an important issue, not just for individuals, but for healthcare professionals and for society as a whole, presenting as it does a major global health challenge. Antimicrobial medicines include antibiotics, antifungal and antiviral treatments, and resistance arises through naturally occurring mutations. Overuse and misuse of antibiotics is thought to be a major cause of resistance, and this is facilitated in many countries by their availability to buy over-the-counter without prescription. However, even where this is not the case, as in the UK, prescribing practices do vary immensely. Not completing courses of antibiotics and prescribing too low doses or for too short a period of time allows stronger, more virulent bacteria to flourish and encourages development of resistance. Resistance to antifungal and antiviral medicines is now also beginning to appear. And none of us should be in any doubt as to the scale of the problem. The global impact of antibiotic resistance cannot be underestimated and has been compared to climate change in terms of its effect on human health. The emergence of infections which are resistant to drug treatment is a growing public health problem. If antibiotics are not used responsibly, then we could be facing a situation in the future where we simply do not have effective cures for infection. In April 2014, the World Health Organization stated that without urgent coordinated action by many stakeholders, the world is headed for a post-antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries, which have been treatable for decades, will once again kill. Presiding officer, that is the scale of the problem that we face. And across the European Union, 25,000 people die from infections caused by multi-drug resistant bacteria. It has been estimated that antimicrobial resistance will affect 10 million more people annually worldwide by 2050. And inappropriate use of antibiotics can have serious public health risks. Antibiotics can disrupt the natural intestine intestinal bacteria, which we all have, allowing organisms like Clostridium difficile to flourish which, with potentially severe consequences for patients. And without effective antibiotics, many routine treatments will become increasingly dangerous, setting broken bones, basic operations, even chemotherapy, all rely on access to antibiotics that work, and many procedures such as hip operations, which currently allow people to live active lives for longer, might become too risky to undertake. Organ transplantation would be severely compromised without the ability to treat secondary infections. And the World Health Organization estimates that the average human lifespan is extended by 20 years through the use of antimicrobials, and global consumption of antibiotics in human medicine rose by nearly 40% between 2000 and 2010. Yet over the past 30 years, a new infectious disease has been discovered almost every year whereas only two new classes of antibiotics have been introduced. For a variety of reasons, antimicrobials are difficult to develop. Potential 
treatments can be difficult to formulate as medicines and expensive in terms of the cost of individual clinical trials for each therapeutic area where the antimicrobial will be used. Furthermore, there is little incentive for pharmaceutical companies to develop medicines which are only used for short periods of time to treat and cure infections. In November last year, I was pleased to host a seminar on behalf of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Parliament where the Scottish Government's Health Care Associated Infection Medical Advisor, Professor Alastair Leonard, outlined the Scottish Government's strategic objectives in this area to improve the knowledge and understanding of antimicrobial resistance, to conserve the effectiveness of existing treatments and to stimulate the development of new antibiotics, diagnostics and novel therapies. The Royal Pharmaceutical Society recently published a scientific guide, New Medicines, Better Medicines, Better Use of Medicines, which recommends educating the public and patients on the use of antibiotics and their place in therapy, encouraging further development of antimicrobial stewardship by healthcare professionals to maintain the effectiveness of current and any future antimicrobials, and supporting the discovery and development of new antimicrobials or treatment methods by developing new financial incentives. Antimicrobial stewardship means prescribing appropriately and conserving the antibiotics we currently have using the evidence-based guidelines developed by specialist teams. And only today we have seen the publication of the recommendations of the Review on Antimicrobial Resistance, chaired by the economist Jim O'Neill, tackling a global health crisis initial steps. This UK-wide initiative is one that has attracted um, a range of clinical and technical input, including from Professor Mark Woolhouse, the Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the University of Edinburgh. And among the recommendations are a global innovation fund of around $2 billion and the training uh, of a new generation of scientists in this field of study. New approaches to developing antimicrobials are urgently required to make it more attractive and to promote innovative research, such as therapies to boost immune systems and using specific viruses which kill bacteria without producing resistance or damaging human cells. Scotland is well placed to encourage this type of research and to work with industry to develop better and safer medicines through innovative research. We must also reduce prescribing to the lowest and safest levels. And here I'm thinking of the, the need to minimise the overuse of broad spectrum antibiotics. In secondary care, prescribers should review prescriptions daily and consider whether antibiotics can be safely stopped or changed from a broad spectrum to a narrow spectrum antibiotic, which has less potential to allow resistant Clostridium difficile infections to develop, improving patient safety in hospitals. Success does depend on sustainable change. There needs to be more awareness among patients and the public on the seriousness of the challenges we face if we are not to return to an era where infections are untreatable. It seems to me that all healthcare professionals must work in partnership with their patients to talk about when antibiotics are necessary and when they are not required. Healthcare professionals are also ideally placed to point out the alternatives which may be available. And it is here that pharmacists have a specific role to play. Specialist pharmacists in Scotland play a leading role in stewardship to ensure appropriate prescribing of antibiotics as part of a multidisciplinary approach through the Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group. And much has already been achieved by antimicrobial pharmacists working with NHS board antimicrobial management teams to influence hospital prescribing. The Scottish Government, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, Community Pharmacy Scotland and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society supported European Antibiotic Awareness Day with a resource pack comprising a poster, patient information leaflets and self-care information sheets which were distributed to all community pharmacies in Scotland. In addition, a self-care guide from the Royal College of General Practitioners has now been adapted for use by community pharmacy within Scotland and it is designed to manage patients' expectations of illness duration and also highlights potentially serious symptoms that warrant further review. Presiding officer, it is only through government's academic research communities, pharmaceutical companies and other stakeholders working together in Scotland, across the UK and internationally that we will raise awareness of this important issue and develop the new funding models necessary to incentivise the development and appropriate use of new antibiotics. In doing so, we will be saving and improving the lives of millions of people, not just here in Scotland, but across the world. What better endeavour could there be than that? Many thanks. 
And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Dr Annette Milne. Uh, Presiding officer, I congratulate Jim Eady on bringing forward this uh, important uh, motion today. The World Health Organisation estimates that uh, average human life has been extended by 20 years uh, through use of antimicrobial uh, agents, yet at the same time we now know that uh, they are a major threat uh, potentially to public health and patient safety. And that's why the uh, central message of European Antibiotic Awareness Day, which is mentioned uh, in the motion, is that antibiotics must be used responsibly to preserve their effectiveness for future generations. The central scientific fact underlying all this is naturally occurring mutations that result in antimicrobial resistance. But bypassing scientific language, the message has to be that we must not misuse or overuse antibiotics. In terms of overuse, I'm told that 55,000 people uh, take antibiotics every day in Scotland and that up to 50% are for conditions that would get better without them. Um, I'm also told that a European survey has indicated that 52% of people in the UK uh, don't realise that uh, antibiotics are ineffective against viruses. It's actually uh, uh, an even higher percentage in other European countries, but that clearly is an alarming statistic. So I think the first task in all of this is clearly to educate the public uh, not to demand uh, antibiotics um, when uh, they are not required, although clearly we'll come on to the responsibilities of health professionals uh, in a moment. Another issue, of course, is that when antibiotics are prescribed to patients, they must complete uh, the course, otherwise uh, stronger uh, bacteria are encouraged uh, to flourish. So I think actually MSPs, and this is alluded to in the motion as well, have a role here in actually publicising some of this, and the motion refers to antibiotic guardian.com, which I've visited, I'm sure others in the chamber may have done, but I hope all MSPs will visit that site, make their own pledge about uh, not uh, overusing antibiotics uh, and make sure they put that post, of course, on their Twitter and Facebook pages, as I have done today. But as I've said, health professionals clearly have uh, an equal, if not greater, responsibility uh, in uh, uh, all of this. I was interested to read again the Antimicrobial Resistance Strategy and Social Action Plan from 2002, when, when I was Health Minister. And among other things, it referred then, obviously, to the importance of prudent antimicrobial use, but also to, uh, of the need for greater coverage of this in, under, in the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, medical um, curriculum. So I think there has been some progress. Again, figures I read for last year said there were as many as 276,000 fewer antibiotic prescriptions in primary care. So I imagine that uh, is progress. But I have been surprised to read of the extent uh, of the problem in secondary care. The Scottish Management of Antimicrobial Resistance Action Plan 2008 says it is known that a significant proportion of current antimicrobial usage in hospitals is not prudent. And again, that could be through excessive or inappropriate use. And Jim Meadie gave the example of Clostridium uh, difficile. And I think the point there is that if a broad spectrum rather than a narrow spectrum antibiotic is used, that can destroy benign bacteria in the, uh, in the gut and uh, encourage the development of Clostridium difficile. And of course, we all know about MRSA, which operates in a, a related kind of, of way. So the public are very aware of these superbugs, but they may not be aware of the relationship of those superbugs to inappropriate use of antibiotics. I mean, in conclusion, we must mention, as Jim Meadie did, the Royal Pharmaceutical uh, Society in general for their work, but particularly for the guide that Jim uh, Eadie referred to, and uh, he actually highlighted the three main points uh, uh, in, their, in, in, in their guide, uh, new medicines, better medicines, uh, better use of medicines, and I wouldn't repeat the words, but clearly much of that was to do with educating the public and health professionals. But the final point that they emphasise, of course, is the importance of supporting the discovery and development of new uh, uh, antimicrobial agents, uh, and they also talk about um, developing new financial incentives for that. I'm not entirely clear what that might involve, but it is a striking fact that there have been so few uh, antibiotics developed uh, over the last few decades, and there are financial reasons for that in terms of people obviously only take them uh, for a short period of time and so on, and it may not be the most 
attractive investment for pharmaceutical companies, but clearly that uh, aspect uh, of the subject is also one that uh, we should remember today. So thanks once again to Jamidi for uh, introducing the debate, and I hope all MSPs will do what they can uh, to promote awareness of this important issue. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Annette Milne to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking Jimmy Dee for highlighting the vital role that the Royal Pharmaceutical Society plays in Scotland and also for raising our awareness of European Antibiotic Awareness Day. I'd like to commend this annual Awareness Day, now in its seventh year and marked on the 18th of November. The key message from this initiative is worthy of repetition, namely that antibiotics must be used responsibly to preserve their effectiveness not just for people now, but also for generations to follow. The various leaflets and posters produced highlight the simple fact that common infections such as coughs, colds, sore throats and earache should not be treated by the use of antibiotics initially. Indeed, despite the fact that antibiotic prescribing for these conditions rose by 40% during the period 1999 to 2011, they were effective in only about 10% of cases. Coming from a medical background and having a husband who's a retired GP, I'm all too well aware that there are instances where, pressures, where prescribing medicines for these types of conditions seems the easy option, but culture has to change. NHS Scotland has supported other UK-wide activities on the 18th of November, such as the Antibiotic Guardian com Campaign, which is a grassroots in initiative asking people from the healthcare professions and ordinary members of the public to read up on the facts and figures regarding antibiotics and to share this information with others. An alarming 25,000 people across Europe die each year as a result of infections which have become resistant to antibiotics. This is one of the biggest threats facing us today, as Jimmy D indicated, and is caused by bacteria essentially fighting back against antibiotics. Community Pharmacy Scotland has also supported this campaign with the promotion of resource packs to its 1,250 community pharmacies throughout Scotland, giving invaluable advice on where and when antibiotics should be used and letting people know that pharmacies often have a dedicated healthcare team who can advise on the right type of treatment for minor ailments without necessarily resorting to the use of antibiotics. Community Pharmacy Scotland also plays a pivotal role in the Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group, or SAPG, which acts as the umbrella organisation for pharmaceutical healthcare in Scotland, bringing together other bodies, such as the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Scotland and Pharmacy Voice. This joined-up approach helps to foster a greater understanding of the use of antibiotics by healthcare professionals. And I was pleased to read that there has been a significant decrease in their unnecessary prescribing in the last two years. I endorse the general ethos of SAPG, which is making the best use of antimicrobials to manage infection so as to ensure optimal outcomes and minimal harm to patients and the wider society. Although there are approximately 160 varieties of antibiotics available, of which there are seven different categories, one of the problems which exists is the clear difference between broad-spectrum and narrow-spectrum antimicrobials, the former covering all manner of infections and the latter targeted at specific bacteria, and the importance, of course, of using the right drug for a specific infection. The rapid spread of multi-drug resistant bacteria brings us closer to the point where we may not be able to prevent or treat everyday infections or diseases, which would have a devastating impact, as Jim Eady said in his opening remarks. Making routine procedures like setting bones, hip replacement, heart surgery, and even chemotherapy dangerous, because all of these procedures rely on effective drugs to either prevent or treat infection. And worrying there, worryingly, there are now only a handful of pharmaceutical companies investing in antibiotic development, resulting in a call for all stakeholders to work together to develop a new funding model to incentivise the development and appropriate use of new products. One such a drug, drug which was brought to my attention just last week is the narrow spectrum, spectrum fidaxomycin, which I understand is the first in its class to be introduced in the past 50 years. It's been approved for use against the studium difficile in adults and has already benefited, benefited nearly 14,000 patients across Europe and over 4,000 in the UK. So the development of such narrow-spectrum drugs effective against specific organisms would make a significant contribution to combating antimicrobial resistance, hence the need to incentivise the development of new products. 
presiding officer, time precludes me from saying more. So I'll close by reiterating my thanks to Jim Eady for alerting us to the urgent need to combat antimicrobial resistance. If we're not to return to an era when infections are untreatable, as they were in the dark ages of my very early childhood before antibiotics were available. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, like others, can I begin by thanking uh, Jim Eady for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber today on an important subject. And I can perhaps move on to a history lesson. In 1877, Louis Pasteur was the first to observe that some types of bacteria obstruct the growth of others. However, it was not until the great Ayrshire biologist, pharmacologist and botanist Sir Alexander Fleming returned from holiday in September 1928 to find his Petri dish contaminated with a strange mould that significant progress was made. It transpired, of course, he had found Penicillium notatum. It was as if the mould had secreted something that inhibited bacterial growth. This discovery created a revolution in the treatment of infections that enabled the successful treatment and prevention of many illnesses that had until then been virtually untreatable. As a result of his endeavours, as we know, Fleming went on to be jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology in, and Medicine in, in 1945. One of penicillin's great successes, of course, was in treating trauma injuries and illnesses sustained by soldiers during Second World War. In many of those cases, it stopped what previously would have been an almost certain decline to gangrenous wounds and an inevitable amputation or septicemia at the very least, which could, of course, be fatal. As a result of this experience, subsequently penicillin was used to treat a multitude of infections, even for those in fortune enough to hand, have an allergy. In due course, there was a development of enthromycin and other non-penicillin-based antibiotics, for which many in my family uh, obviously have a great deal of use. Progress has been substantial. A very good example has to be tuberculosis, at one time threatening the masses, but however, as a direct result of antibiotics and an inoculation program, TB has virtually been eradicated, at least in the Western world. However, TB has seen a recent upsurge in the world's population. This is in part due to the overenthusiasm for the use of antibiotics, and there are at times and there at times inappropriate and incorrect use could not escape the attention of anyone, it's becoming increasingly the case that conditions previously su successfully treated are now it, no longer so, so successfully treated. For the science enthusiasts among you, there could be no better micro-example of the process of evolution. The antibiotic's attack on the offending bacterial inve infection is brilliant in that it defeats the dominant bacteria, but in doing so, it leads other bacterium that previously were outcompeted. Despite their previous weaknesses, the remaining bacteria, unaffected by the antibiotic, become dominant, not only resistant to the treatment, but now without a bacterial competitor. Hence, we have the superbugs. Natural selection, survival of the fittest, this has left us with ever-evolving strains of bacterium, such as MRSA. We were warned, of course. Sir Alexander Fleming spoke of the dangers of resistance back in his Nobel Prize speech in 1945. So where do we go from here? One way, obviously, is... Uh, is to continue to evolve drugs, not quite out-competing, but at least reacting to a changing common enemy. However, developments in new antibiotics have been few and far between, apart from the recent discovery by US scientists published in the journal Nature, which has been described as a game-changer, with experts believing the antibiotic call is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, clearly, raising standards of health in the population creates a population less susceptible to infection, but there will always be those unfortunate enough to require medical attention. So we have to be particularly mindful of the elderly and sufferers of diseases like HIV and AIDS that make them particularly susceptible to infection. So I'm pleased with others that the Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group, SAPG, has demonstrated an impact through the de decrease of 6.5% in the number of prescriptions last year. Jim Eady has already referred to the World Health Organization report. It was a bit more graphic in its opening bit when it said that global surveillance of antimicrobial resistance, finally get it right, reveals that antibiotic resistance is no longer a prediction for the future. It's happening right now across the world and is putting at risk the ability to treat common infections in the community and hospitals. So we have a real problem and one which I think this debate has uh, done well to highlight. I thank Jim Eady once again for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Thank you. And finally, Dr Richard Simpson, after which we'll move to the closing speech of the Minister.
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I can begin by reiterating thanks to Jim Eady for bringing this important debate, for, for describing Antibiotic Awareness Day, which I think is important, the, the program of signing up as antibiotic champions, which I think is, is an interesting development, which we will see how it proceeds. And of course, the work of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, and as Nanette Milne referred to the, that in community pharmacy, just one issue on community pharmacy is that we do in Scotland have a fairly unique approach in the minor ailment scheme. This is currently restricted to those who were previously eligible for free prescriptions, a bureaucratic area which seems to me needs to be addressed by the new health team, uh, as it is, uh, 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 I think, regrettable. Uh, historically, uh, when I was a student, uh, we had major concerns about rheumatic heart disease arising from um, staphylococcal or streptococcal, usually infection in the throat, and therefore we used antibiotics, um, sometimes sprayed antibiotics around the place. It was really, uh, we now know, not a very good course of action. Um, but th there is undoubtedly pressure from patients on general practitioners, and general practitioners are, we should recognize, under absolutely massive pressure and therefore to take the time to explain to a patient that actually their condition is probably viral um, it, it is difficult. They don't have diagnostic tests that they can apply on the spot, and that's an area of research we need to develop, because if we had that, we might be able to uh, more readily distinguish between those upper respiratory tract infections, which were actually uh, bacterial and required treatment to prevent rheumatic heart disease, or when, and were indeed viral. Um, there have been try attempts by general practitioners to introduce things like delayed prescribing, where they give the patient the prescription but ask them not to take it for two or three days and only to take it if actually the condition worsens. And there's some evidence that actually that, that is, is, is quite useful and quite helpful. Uh, Roderick Campbell mentioned t tuberculosis, and of course it has been a massive advanced streptomycin Passina, and I, th I can't remember the name of the third, Isonizid, I think it was, are the three, the traditional three treatments for uh, tuberculosis. But we do now have resistant tuberculosis, and the minister will probably be aware that I've asked a number of questions about the development of uh, techniques to try and ensure that this does not become a significant problem among certain populations like homeless, uh, like some of the refugees who come from, from really very uh, difficult uh, situations into our country. We need to have a situation which, in fact, ensures that that is taken care of. The, the tuberculosis, of course, was something which every student entering university was x-rayed for at the beginning of their course. I'm not in any way advocating a return to that sort of global screening, but I do think we need to keep a very close watch on this issue. We debated it in the public health bill in the last parliament because in South Africa, people with resistant tuberculosis are actually locked up until their treatment is, uh, is successful. And that is sometimes uh, ext extremely difficult. We are in an era which recognizes that anti antimicrobial resistance is in fact very important. And anything the government can do by way of publicity as part of its winter resilience program uh, to advocate the non-use of antibiotics would be welcome. Jamidi and others have mentioned specialist pharmacists, and they have played an enormous role within the hospital setting to ensure that junior doctors don't, in fact, misuse antibiotics. And the use of broad-spectrum antibiotics has contributed to the reduction in the use, has contributed to the significant reduction in C. difficile, which the government should be applauded for in, the, in their programme. But I have to say to them that we are now falling behind England in terms of what we're achieving. And the introduction of the new Fidexamycin C. difficile, which was approved by the Scottish Medicines Consortium, is only just onto the protocols in many hospitals, and we are considerably behind England in its use. England, in England, health protection there, they are the, our equivalent public health England, actually issued guidance 18 months ago, whereas HPS only issued guidance three months ago. We cannot continue to have situations in which we are behind others. And Deputy Presiding Officer, I'll finish with just one uh, two other very brief notes. One is that there is a whole new science around what is called the microbiome. Every one of us has billions of bacteria in our gut. And the, the, the good bacteria are absolutely essential to our liver. We live in a symbiotic relationship with our bacteria in our gut. And we treat them with disrespect at our peril because that can lead to all sorts of problems. 
And I have one final concern, which is not the, the area uh, for, for, for the current minister who's about to reply, um, but that is the use of antibiotics in veterinary medicine. And I think that that is something that we need to look very carefully at. 50 years after the Swan report, this is still a significant issue. Thank you. Many, many thanks. I now call on the Minister to close the debate on behalf of the Government Minister, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I too would like to congratulate Jim Eady on bringing this subject forward for debate and setting out the stark situation. And I also welcome the work of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Scotland and the Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group and the work they are doing to heighten the awareness of this issue. Um, I thank all the members for their contributions from Rod Campbell giving us a history lesson to the contributions from Nanette Milne and Richard Simpson who bring their professional uh, knowledge to the subject. In 2008, this government recognised the importance of raising awareness of resistance to antibiotics and the need for specific actions and advice to provide all healthcare professionals and the public on what we need to do to help prevent such resistance increase. That is why we set up SAPG, a National Clinical Multidisciplinary Forum. European Anti Ant Antibiotic Awareness Day is a major public health initiative now held annually since 2008. It aims to encourage responsible use of antibiotics and tackle the global issue of resistance to them. I commend the contribution of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Scotland to the e e EAAD campaign. They have supported EAD from the outset through media and communications to pharmacists and for the past two years have been greatly involved in the planning of the Scottish activities. During the 2014 campaign, RPS Scotland, in partnership with the Scottish Government, SAPG and Community Pharmacy Scotland, were central to our self-care leaflets initiative. These leaflets support pharmacists in providing patients with specific advice about symptoms of respiratory illness as well as facilitating, refer facilitating referral to a GP if required. <clears throat> the primary aim of these leaflets is to promote community pharmacies as the first port of call for advice and treatment for winter illnesses which are typically called by, caused by viruses and to reduce patient expectations for antibiotics as the first line of treatment. This has attracted interest from Public Health England who are looking to replicate this approach there. Each year, a Scottish antimicrobial <coughs> prescribing group organises distribution of EAAD support packages to each NHS board. These are tailored and disseminated to hospitals, GP practices, care homes and other healthcare providers. Community pharmacies receive their packs as part of their year-round support of national public health campaigns. As Jim Eady high, uh, highlighted, an important component of this annual campaign is the Antibiotic Guardian initi Initiative. Anyone can sign up to be a garden, guardian, and I'm <coughs> pleased that Malcolm Chisholm has done, from healthcare professionals, vets, and farmers to members of the public. SAPG promote sign up to this initiative in all communications about EAAD and many staff working within the area of antimicrobial stewardship have used the antibiotic Guard guardian logo signature strip to promote it. To date over 12,000 people have signed up across the UK. On signing up the guardian chooses an action pledge to help support the overarching aim to ensure <coughs> antibiotics work now and in the future. Public Health England will shortly be sending an evaluation questionnaire to all guardians who have consented to follow up. This will help measure and confirm if guardian pledges were kept. Planning for the, two, the 2015 campaign will com commence in the spring and I would encourage members to play their part locally in raising awareness. What better way than to become an antibiotic guardian? Since 2008, infection prevention and quality improvement teams have achieved a significant reduction, as has been mentioned, in C. diff rates and a reduction in the prescribing of high-risk antibiotics through the introduction of local and national prescribing indicators. The latest SAPG uh, annual report published in January 
uh, last month shows that there has been a decrease of 5.4% in the number of prescriptions for antibacterials in primary care GP practices in Scotland. Also, the use of broad-spectrum antibacterials associated with higher risk of C. diff reduced by 12.7% in primary care settings. These figures are encouraging. However, further work linking C. diff cases with morbidity, mortality and prescribing data is being carried out to help understand the epidemiology of disease in the community and identify areas for further reduction measures. <coughs> As many um, of the members taking part in the debate mentioned, resistance to antimicrobials continue to pose a serious public health threat globally. The loss of effective antimicrobials undermines our ability to fight infectious diseases and manage the infectious complications common in vulnerable parents. A key challenge is the fact that few new antimicrobials have been developed. A key area of work in the effort to tackle the threat of global antimicrobial resistance was the setting up of a UK five-year AMR strategy which launched in September 2013. The UK and Sweden led the development and adoption of a new World Health Organization resolution on AMR, providing a mandate for the development of a WHO-led global action plan by May 2015. Through the UK strategy, we are working with the WHO and member states to develop the plan which will take a One Health approach. <coughs> This government works closely with the UK government and the other devolved administrations to drive forward this work aimed at slowing the development and spread of antimicrobial resistance. The first annual report published in December 2014 showed good progress had been made. The Scottish government is fully committed to supporting this strategy and related initiatives to main maintain focus and pace through achieving further reduction, around achieving further reductions in HAIs and ensure appropriate antibiotic prescribing and vigilance against resistance to anti antibiotics. To tie in with this work, the government through the Scottish HAI Task Force set up an expert group controlling antimicrobial resistance in Scotland, or CARS for short, chaired by the Scottish Government's Chief Medical Officer to oversee Scotland's antimicrobial resistance strategy and support delivery of the UK AMR strategy. CARS will also build upon and maintain the momentum generated by the Scottish Management of Antimicrobial Resistance Action Plan uh, version 2, which was published last July and is up at the back of the chamber. CARS will produce a delivery plan focusing on the seven key areas of the UK strategy. It will develop outcome measures and publish an annual report on progress that aligns with the UK strategy. Within NHS Scotland, an AMR <coughs> public awareness campaign will be developed and delivered by Health Scotland with input from other key agencies in 2015-16. And this government is committed to supporting this important work through the Scottish HAI Task Force. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, Scotland has established itself as a leader in antimicrobial stewardship and is recognised worldwide as having an exemplar antimicrobial stewardship programme. Through the work of organisations such as the RPSS, SAPG <coughs> and other key stakeholders, huge inroads have been made in ensuring adherence to local prescribing guidelines across hospital and primary care settings. However, continued efforts are required to sustain and further improve this. And I thank Jim Eady for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Many thanks. And I thank you all. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30.